we're talking about normal distributions. And this is um, just a way that some variables are distributed, meaning how many small values, how many large values, how many in the middle. Um, and so we're going to talk about the normal distribution and with it uh, different ways that we can talk about how a population is spread out over a normal distribution. Let's talk about some of the key features of the normal distribution. So first of all, the graph of a normal distribution is bell-shaped. Okay, This is the classic curve that we're, people are used to. Um, it has a peak in the middle and then it tapers off um, on either side and never actually touches the horizontal axis. Let's look at a picture down here so we can see it. Okay, This is the picture of the normal distribution. So you can see we've got our peak and then it tapers off on the left and on the right and actually goes forever and ever, uh, technically never touching the axis. Um, next um, is just kind of interpretations about that curve. So data values farther from the mean are less common than data values closer to the mean. So the mean is actually where the peak is. Um, and since it's a high value on this uh, curve, high values here indicate how frequently we see those values um, in the population. Um, and so as we move away from the mean, it's less common. Okay, We've got the symmetry with the single peak. And then it turns out that the mean, median, and mode are all the same thing, um, and they occur at the peak of the distribution. And because of symmetry, okay, this last uh, thing is that on the left of the mean, which is our vertical axis right here, we have 50% of the data, and on the right we have 50%. That means that the total area, okay, under the curve being 100%, 50% is to the left of the mean, and 50% is to the right of the mean. So let's just look at some examples of normally distributed variables. Okay, so variables where our uh, our population follows a normal distribution. So first, the amount of time it takes for students to get from first period to second period in a high school class. Well, um, the on the low end of this, of course, is like you know just a couple seconds. Okay, people that don't have to walk very far to get between first and second period. It's going to take them just a tiny bit to get there. But the, we expect most students to show up um, around the same time. Okay, and so we get kind of our, our peak um, in, the, uh, in the curve. And then towards the end, maybe after the bell rings, uh, we see the tapering off of, of people showing, off, showing up. So that would be a normal distribution. Second, uh, the height of high school students. So height is kind of the classic example of a normally distributed uh, variable. So average height may be 5'6 or 5'7 um, and uh, a lot of people are around that height um, but then for really short uh, there's much less people and for really high there's much less people. Really tall people there's much fewer of them. Uh, the, sh the shoe size of five-year-olds, same idea there, right? If most five-year-olds will have around the same size shoe but so some Five-year-olds have really small feet, and some five-year-olds have really big feet for their age. And so that's where we get the bell shape there, the normal distribution. Uh, for this fourth one, the, the amount of time in the microwave it takes for a popcorn kernel to pop. So if you think about when you put a bag of popcorn kernels into the microwave and you set the microwave going, okay, at first there's nothing. So that's kind of our low, our low peak. But then some kernels start to pop, okay? And as time goes on, lots and lots start to pop, right? And then it starts to level out, and then as time goes on towards the end, there are less and less that are popping that took that long. And so you get your normal distribution. Same idea with uh, scores on a math chat test. Okay, we've got our average, and a lot of people get around average. And, uh, and a few people get really low because they didn't prepare for their test. And a few people do really well, okay? So that's a normal distribution as well. And then our final example would, could be the weight of one scoop of ice cream. Okay, so if you go to uh, Baskin Robbins and you get a scoop of ice cream, uh, when the people scoop that ice cream, most of their scoops are going to be around the mean, okay, the average there. But every once in a while, maybe they'll do really big scoops, or every once in a while, they'll do a smaller than average scoops. Um, and so that would be another normal distribution. 
So let's talk about what determines the shape of the normal distribution. Um, every normal distribution is perfectly described by the center and the spread. Okay, and the center, that's where our peak occurs. Okay, and so that center is actually the mean, okay, or mu. So the center is mu, center is mu, and then the spread is measured with the standard deviation. Spread is measured with standard deviation, which is sigma, okay? So um, this is mean and standard deviation. Okay, so I want to just um, show you what this looks like. Um, so here we have a, um, a picture of a normal curve. And up in the top left, we've got S and M. S is, gonna, is for uh, standard deviation and M is for mean. And uh, we want to just see what happens when we change these around. So I'm just going to go ahead and slide my mean around. Okay, so my M. So make it smaller, my, my peak moves to the left. Move it bigger, my peak moves to the right. Okay, so that's kind of what we expect there. That just, it just moves the whole curve, nothing about how spread out it is. If we change our standard deviation, notice if I increase my standard deviation, it gets pulled out, it gets stretched out, it's really spread out, okay? It's still a bell curve, all right? This is still a normal distribution, but it's really spread out. I can also go to a very small standard deviation. So it goes smaller and smaller. And what happens is it becomes less and less spread out. Okay, it becomes, it all gets all bunched up right around um, our mean, okay? So that's, uh, that's how we describe standard or uh, normal distributions. Okay, we know if we know the mean and the standard deviation, that's gonna perfectly tell us what the, um, normal distribution looks like. Now, because the normal distribution is perfectly described by the mean and the standard deviation, we can actually extend that into the regions um, that the mean and standard deviations break up the uh, normal distribution into. And that gives us what's called the empirical rule. It's also sometimes called the 68, 95, and 99.7 rule. And the rule is precisely this, that uh, 60, approximately, this is all approximately, okay? So about 68% of the data observations lie within one standard deviation of the mean. So let's look at that down here in the picture, okay? So we've got our mean, it happens at our peak, okay, is right there. That's gonna be our mu, okay? And then 68% of the data is within one standard deviation. So if I move one standard deviation to the right and one standard deviation to the left, that gives me this region underneath the curve. And that is 68% of the observations, okay? Um, so for example, um, IQ scores are um, normally distributed with a mean of 100 and a standard de deviation of about 15 points. What this means then is that based on, uh, on this portion of the empirical rule, about 68% of the population 68% of all people have an IQ between uh, 85 and 115, okay? Because that's within, that's 15 points within the mean of 100, okay? Then we go one step further and say, if I go two standard deviations, then that's 95% of the data observations, okay? So if I go from my mean, um, say we're looking at our IQ example again, the IQ, average IQ is 100, and if I go two standard deviations, so 115 is one standard deviation, and 130 is two standard deviations, and then down two, so down 15 is one, and then down another 15. This tells me that 95% of all people have an IQ between 70 and 130, okay? And then the final part of the empirical rule is that 99.7% of data, so that's a huge, that's pretty much everyone, um, are within three standard deviations. Okay, um, and so that'd be up to 145 and then down to, uh, to 55 in the context of the IQ scores. So that's the, what the empirical rule says. And it actually 
um, we can we can take these numbers and kind of break it down because we know underneath the curve total, okay, from forever to the left and forever to the right, that's 100%, of course, of all observations. And so we can start breaking things up and say, well, I can use symmetry and say, if I break 68% in half, then I get two regions that are 34% uh, each. Okay, and so I end up with this, uh, this thing here. And I've marked this here based on our mean uh, mu, and then minus one sigma, minus two sigma, minus three sigma, okay? Plus one sigma, plus two sigma, plus three sigma. And we get these numbers here. And this is kind of probably going to be the easiest to work off of um, to figure out these numbers. Now, these numbers are obtained by just taking the 68 and dividing by 2. And then uh, taking 95. 95 is from the far, uh, from 2 away. So that's from here to here. Okay. And then breaking that in half. But then using the fact that we know that that's 34%. Okay, and so you just go through and, and calculate them, or you just memorize the numbers. So that's the empirical rule. Go ahead and use the empirical rule. Okay, so assume that the weight of one year old girls in the USA is normally distributed with a mean of about 9.5 kilograms and a standard deviation of approximately 1.1 kilograms. Estimate the percentage of one-year-old girls who weigh less than 8.4 kilograms. Okay, so what we're going to do is look at our uh, standard normal distribution, and we're just going to start labeling our key points based on the, uh, the information that's given here. So our... Um, mean here is 9.5 kilograms. So I can put 9.5 right there at my mean. And then my standard deviation is 1.1. That means if I take my 9.5 and add 1.1, I get 10.6. That's going to be this next one. And then add 1.1. 11.1. Add 1.1. Okay. I can go in the opposite direction as well. 9.5 minus 1.1. Minus 1.1 is 7.1, okay, etc. So we can label these key points. Now we care specifically about the percentage of one-year-olds who weigh less than 8.4 kilograms. So I go and I find my 8.4 kilograms, and that's right here. And I'm looking for the percentage that's less than that. So from this marker right here, I then move and I add up all these percentages. 13.5 plus 2.35 plus 0 0.15. And I just add those up. So I've got 13.5 plus 2.35 plus 0 0.15. I just add those up and I end up with 16. That's 16%. So 16% of one year old girls weigh less than 8.4 kilograms. Okay, and then we can go down. Let's go to the next thing. I want to estimate the percentage of one-year-old girls who weigh between 7.3 kilograms and 11.7. .7. So I just go to my, my chart again, and I look at uh, 7.3, and it's right there, and 11.7 .7 is right there. Okay, and I just can add up all those percentages. Okay, Notice that that's actually between two less than and two greater than. So I know that's within two standard deviations of my mean, I know that's 95, okay? But if you don't remember that, you just add them all up from your chart. So 13.5 plus 34 plus 34 plus 13.5, okay? And that gives you 95%. Okay, and then our next one, we've got estimate the percentage of one-year-old girls who weigh more than 12.8. So I go to my chart, and I see 12.8 right here, and I'm just looking for the percentage that's greater than that. And that's just 0.15%. Nothing to add, it's just one region. So that's my answer.